Well, hello and welcome again to Coming Home Network Presents, where we have conversations about the kinds of questions that people wrestle with, either on their way into or back to the Catholic faith, sometimes questions that come up as people are exploring the church and wondering if they should become a part of it. I'm Matt Swaim, Director of Outreach for the Coming Home Network. If you're dealing with issues like the ones uh, we're going to discuss today about memory and memorization and and some of that, uh, please come visit us at chnetwork.org. We have tons and tons of free resources uh, to help you kind of sort some of these questions out. They're all questions that we've sorted out too, so don't feel dumb for asking anything at all. Um, and of course, if you want to give to support our work, chnetwork.org slash donate is where you can go for that. I'm very excited to have two of my favorite gentlemen in the world who I've known both of them for upwards of 15 years uh, through various projects, the books that they've written. Mike Aquilina uh, joining us now, also Dr. Kevin Vost. They're Resumes are too long for me to read on the air, but let's just say they both have a lot to say about today's topic of memory, memorization, and and things of that nature, and uh, we'll have links to all their stuff in the show notes today. Mike, Kevin, good morning. Good morning, morning. Matt. And Mike. Okay, so topic today is memory, memorization, all of this. Um, a lot of Protestants look at the church from the outside and say, Catholics can't be sincere. They have so much stuff that they've just memorized, right? Or um, perhaps they wonder when we talk about remembering Christ in the sacrifice of the Mass, like, what do we mean by that? Or uh, maybe they're in a situation like I was the first time I ever went to Mass, and we launched into this thing where everybody started with, I believe in God the Father, and I thought, how do all these people in this room have this big, long thing memorized without looking? <laughs> so... So it's a big question, but we'll start with you, Mike. Uh, what role did memory and memorization play in your childhood as a Catholic growing up before you kind of walked into the jungle and away from the faith for a little bit? Well, I, I think um, I, I think memory plays a big part in everyone's growing up. Memorization plays a big part in everyone's growing up because when we're very young, we memorize things. We we we, we memorize nursery rhymes. We we memorize. Um, uh, little principles like a stitch in time saves nine. This is this is how we we commit things, uh, you know, to memory uh, to, uh, to to so they'll stay there. Uh, so that's what we do when we're very young, uh, and and when we're very old, we're glad those things are there. You know, when we're very young, we're trying on grown up speech, and this is one way to do it. Okay, to make it stick there and try it on and rehearse it over and over again, and it stays. When we're very old, uh, those things tend to still be there, and uh, we're grateful that they are. My father-in-law uh, died uh, last year after after a couple years struggle with dementia, and you know, toward the end of his life, he didn't have a clear idea of what my name was, but he could still recite the Midnight Ride of Paul Revere, right? Because he had memorized it when he was a small child. It was just burned in there, and I think he was glad he had that. It's something he could hold on to. So memorization is just something that 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 comes that that we do as human beings, um, uh, and we did a lot more of it, I think, before we could Google everything, you know, at a moment's notice. When I was a kid, we had to memorize the entire Baltimore Catechism, and I'm grateful for that, you know, because there are times in your life when you want to know why did God make me. Right. <laughs> because that's a burning question. But you have an answer to that question somewhere stored away in your memory if you had to memorize the Baltimore Catechism in 1972 the way I did. You know, I didn't memorize the Baltimore Catechism because, well, you don't do that in the Church of the Nazarene. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but right. Uh, we did memorize a lot of Bible stuff. I right. uh, did a lot of Bible quizzing um, as a kid and was actually fairly competitive of such things. And, you know, I remember having a little drum machine. Um, and a boom box, and I put like a beat down, and I would read Paul's prison epistles to a beat to get it to stick <laughs> in my brain so that I could, you know, in Bible quizzing competitions in like ninth grade, you know, come out strong out of the gates. But I love um, it. You know, Dr. Vost, uh, you know, and Mike, you've talked before, by the way, about how memorization was like huge in your early life, and we're going to get to it a little bit later about how there was kind of a shift and it was just wasn't important anymore, and that was kind of a, well, kind of, kind of set you adrift a little bit, you know, that, mm -hmm. that, that shift in, in memorization not being important anymore in your catechesis. But, but Dr. Vos, was memorization um, much a part of your life, either as a f in the realm of faith or any other realm when you were growing up? 
Well, I remember when I was really little, you know, I had the benefit of a Catholic education, and I, I wish I did get the chance to, to memorize the entire Baltimore Catechism. That sounds amazing. I, I would love to have that in my repertoire now. But as I remember going through school, uh, we, we learned the standard prayers, you know, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, the Glory Be, and thanks be to God, even though when I went through years being away from the church, those were instantly there uh, when I came back. Thinking of other ways that memorization was valued, I remember... Uh, um, they valued memorizing how to spell words because <laughs> we all has had spelling bee championships. So I was really into that. And that was a thing that served me well later in life, you know, when I came, started writing books, even though they do have spell check and things now. I remember one incident in high school where we had an American presidency class. And our task there was to um, memorize the entire Gettysburg Address. And I remember there, there was two guys, myself and another guy, we had like perfect scores going throughout the course. And I thought maybe this is going to be the tiebreaker. But if I remember right, I think we both, we both got that one right. And, and I looked it up again. The Gettysburg Address has 274 words. I checked out the Nicene Creed and it says it has 224 words. So that's actually, you know, a little bit uh, easier. But there's also a principle with memorization, it's the ancient, you know, Latins used to say that repetitio mater memoriae, or repetition is the mother of memory. And things that we, we don't repeat, if we haven't really repeated them thoroughly when we're young, they're gone. Like I, four score in seven years, something like that might be about all I can tell you from the Gettysburg Address now. But those prayers that are learned when you're very young and they are repeated, yes, they will remain robust throughout the rest of your life. So I love uh, Mike's story about his father and the midnight ride of Paul Revere. I remember reading uh, the life story of St. Albert the Great, Thomas Aquinas' teacher, and it's believed that he may have suffered dementia at the end of his life. And they said that one thing that he retained till, toward, till the very end of his life was the capacity to say the Mass mm. because he had so thoroughly memorized it and, and performed it time after time after time. That's beautiful. Yeah, I've known that as well from... Uh, People who have dementia or advanced Alzheimer's and uh, people go to their bedside and still pray the rosary with them and, and the people are like locked in um, mm -hmm. for the whole thing. Uh, they can't they can't tell you who's in the room with them, but they can they can pray those prayers. Right. And right. it's like an anchor, an anchor for them. Uh, before we jump into a little bit, because obviously memorization was not enough to keep either one of you guys in the church. <laughs> right. 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 Uh, just on, on its own. Um Objectify, but but Dr. Vos, since you've done a, a fair amount of writing about memory and, and, and these sorts of things, what is it about the brain at that age that allows uh, kids, like for instance, you know, my son goes to school with a lot of kids who are first generation in this country and they are all bilingual and it's not because they're super geniuses who have advanced degrees in Spanish and French and things and Vietnamese or, or whatever. It's because like their brains are, are wired a certain way to be able to pick that stuff up. Like what is it about the brain that allows for that? Yeah, you know, especially when we're young, the brain has an amazing plasticity, ability to grow and adapt and incorporate all kinds of information and new things, you know, in a way that we may not retain fully as we grow older. And even there, there's a little insight from where when St. Thomas Aquinas talks about perfecting our memory, <clears throat> when he's urging us, if we're going to use special memory techniques to make our reminders kind of wild and crazy or extreme or unusual, so they really stick. And he says it's because kind of like when we're children, the world is new to us. And in a sense, everything is new and different and unusual. So those things that were taught early on, we're more likely to be to be kind of fascinated by them and they're, they're going to stick. You know, Mike, you're going back through this uh, here pretty soon um, with grandbabies <laughs> where uh, you're going to you probably are a few years removed from you forgetting to do things or forgetting how something goes and your kids being like, dad. And now it's going to be like, grandpa, like you got it wrong. You said the word out of order. You know, I mean, the kids are, they key in on this stuff, man. They keep you honest on these yeah. memorization things. Yeah. I want to give a note of hope though. Uh, my, my wife is an adult convert, so she was not exposed to any of the Catholic prayers as a child. And I think she felt uh, the whole thing was daunting at the beginning. You know, she wanted to be Catholic when she converted. She wanted that very badly. But I think she she felt that she would always uh, be a kind of second rate, that she'd never really get the hang of it. Now, now all of these things come quite naturally after 30 years of repetition, uh, because, uh, because she's, she's stuck with it. You know, she's made it part of, part of her routine, part of her disciplines, and, and it's, it's part of life. I, I think that, that biblical religion has always been this way. The Psalms were meant to be prayers that were learned, prayers that were recited. 
through most of the history of the Jewish people and the Christian people, most people could not own books. Pe most people could not read books. So how did you get these things? And how did you keep them? And how did you pass them on to your children? You, you learned scripture by praying scripture. Right, You went to the, the synagogue, or on the feast days you went to the temple, and you sang those psalms, and they committed themselves you know, to your, to your mind, to your memory. And afterwards they were always there, so that you, you could make your own the sentiments of King David. They're in the scriptures for a reason. Yeah, they certainly are. And I want to get into, um, well, I want to get into a couple things you said. I want to get into how the early church... Uh, and through oral cultures, used those things in kind of a more systematic way. Because you've written a book about how the choir did that and how music yeah. did that. And you've written how poetry helped yeah. to teach theology over the years uh, because it's memorable. But I also, I mean, this is one of the other main reasons that I wanted to do this episode is because I felt just like your wife. When I first came into the church from my background, I thought, there's no way I'm going to memorize all this stuff, yeah. right? This is insane. This is you've got <laughs> lists of everything. <laughs> and uh and yeah, there is there is hope. And Dr. Vost, you've written books about techniques for memorizing these things, and I hope we can get to that in a little bit. But uh, for both of you, you've both been on the journey home and shared your story at great length, and I encourage people to check those stories out. But um, but for you, Dr. Vost, when you came back to the faith, because you spent some wild years in Nietzsche land, <laughs> um, what role did those those anchor prayers, those those prayers you remembered, um, uh, you know, what, what role did they play in kind of reactivating as you came back to the church? Yeah, well, they kind of reminded me, you know, I, I was baptized as a child. I was raised within the church. So this is still, it's still within me. So in a sense, it made me kind of realize, you know, in a sense, I left the church and left God, but God never left me, you know, I was also meant to come back. So when I came back, you know, going to mass, hearing those familiar words, it's just a great sense of solace, a great sense of something lost, is now regained. So it was very, very important uh, to my faith that I'm familiar. I know how to pray now. I still know how to pray the Our Father, the Hail Mary, and so on. But then, you know, I came into the church you know, partly through the, the well, the stirrings of the Holy Spirit, and then reading Saint Thomas Aquinas, who who showed me what what Nietzsche got wrong, what Bertrand Russell, what Ayn Rand, what these atheists got wrong. Uh, so I, I became absorbed in Thomas's philosophy and theology. But then I also came to realize shortly after in his biblical commentaries and in other works that, that he wrote, he went through some of our standard Catholic prayers, the Creed, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, and then explained to us step by step what virtually every single word means. Mm -hmm. So an adult, when I came back, I realized these prayers that we, remember, they're far more than just a list of words. Every word, you know, has, has multiple layer, layers of reading, uh, meaning. In fact, just today, I, I look back in Thomas's commentary on the Gospel of St. Matthew for the section where he talks about the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6, and tells us what other church fathers have had to say about that. And I saw that Thomas spends about 22 and a half pages just talking about the Lord's Prayer itself. So there's this great richness, I realize, in every single prayer. And kind of the more you dig in, the more you understand the meaning, you know, the, the more you're going to be get a sense of wonder and awe and love for God. You know, Mike, uh, when you were coming back, was it, I'm trying to remember your story, was it Aquinas you were translating when all the light bulbs popped back off and it all came back? But one of his poems, you know, it wasn't it wasn't anything from the Summa. It was one of his poems, and uh, and it was it was quite by chance. Uh, yeah, if was, you could uh, talk about how that circumstance came about, because I think it's a really neat story that kind of really gets at this question of memory. Well, I was a writing major at Penn State, and I had a very challenging uh, course my senior year, and it was. Um, it was a poetry seminar, and uh, the, the guy who was teaching it uh, was pretty rigorous, and he would he wanted us to understand form and how it worked. So he wanted us uh, to to choose a foreign language poem in a foreign language form, and uh, and to work it into English, and then explain what we did and describe the the difficulties, what can be translated and what cannot be translated uh, as you move from one, one language to another. And it was a bear of a project. Um, I, I had taken one year of Latin in high school, had a great teacher. I had taken four years of Spanish, but I remembered more Latin than Spanish, uh, also because of the memorization that our teacher made us do. So, um, uh, so I went... Um, I, I went into the library and I got out the Oxford Book of Latin verse and uh, 
And there I uh, I just opened to a random page and I said, I'll translate what's on that page. And it was St. Thomas Aquinas' Adorote Devote. So, uh, so I went through uh, and I translated that poem. And I think by the end of the translation assignment, I was I was back. You know what I mean? I was I I, I had made my way uh, back to the church in some sense. It took me a while to get right with the sacraments and everything, but but that was the thing that did me. It is interesting, and again, the memorization alone. You know, we're not we don't have our brain over here and our soul over here and our right. heart somewhere else. I mean, these are all they're all meant to go together, right? Part of the right. reason that the church. Um, wants us to have these things is because it, it wants us, it, uh, us to be formed as, as entire people. But what strikes me is that um, so often I'll hear from cradle Catholics who hear about converts who've studied their way into the church or studied their way, their way back to the to the church. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, you guys are such better Catholics than, than we are. And I'm like, hey, you got something in your bones that I didn't have, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I'm still absorbing. I'm still figuring this out. Uh, whereas certain people who have been in the Mass for, you know, 70 80 years uh i don't think they they realize how much of this is has just shaped everything about who they are yeah and another thing uh you know when when you're at sunday mass and everybody's reciting the nicene creed that doesn't mean that everyone has the nicene creed memorized okay because when you're doing something in a herd like that you can kind of drop out uh, for a line if you don't quite remember what the line is and then duck back in i myself after a life as a catholic um uh, still kind of confuse the lines of the Nicene Creed with the Apostles' Creed. <laughs> you know, they get jumbled up in my memory. And so I find myself reciting lines from the Apostles' Creed at Mass on Sunday. And I'll bet a, a lot of the people who are around you are doing the same or something similar. You know, that's that's so interesting. And, and Dr. Vos, I'd love your thoughts on this as well. But that in some ways, that's the mystery of the church, like, as a whole. So... You can walk into a mass. If you go to pew to pew, person to person on a Sunday during the Nicene Creed, you'd hear a few people going too fast, some people going too slow. <laughs> you'd hear some people just completely dropping out for about 20 seconds. You'd hear other people who are saying a previous translation of the Nicene Creed. And yet, if you were to stand in the back of the room and listen, what you'd hear would be the creed, right? That's what you'd hear, right? You'd hear the faith of the church. With all these people doing it, somehow imperfectly uh it's still it's still the faith of the church but uh but with that dr vost i mean can you talk about like the value that that albert and thomas and some of these others and we'll get into how they did it uh but the value they saw in committing these things to memory sure sure and i had to chuckle to myself when i heard mike uh, talking i i've never used the formal memory methods for the uh nicene creed or apostles creed so i probably tend to do the same thing as myself kind of Kind of co-mix them there, but yes, but you get a congregation together at mass, and uh, enough people know enough parts of it that you are going to hear the creed uh, each time. But yeah, it, and part of my area of specialty in psychology was um, memorization. Uh, I did a master's thesis on how to help adolescent students learn their academic material better using special visual imagery uh, techniques. And my doctoral work was at an Alzheimer's center, and I worked with some not the Alzheimer's patients, but people with other kinds of brain damage and apply these techniques. But, but the kind of special techniques I specialized in were actually written about by St. Albert the Great and St. Thomas Aquinas. There's a great historian of this, what's called the art of memory, Frances Yates, a British uh, historian. And she said, uh, if Simonides was this art's inventor and Cicero was its teacher, St. Thomas Aquinas was its patron saint. You know, and she's a secular writer. Uh, but yeah, there's this ancient memory tradition that goes back to Simonides and ancient Greek. Cicero passed it along to the Latin uh, reading world. And St. Thomas and Albert being fascinated with, with virtually everything and wanting to understand the human being, how we are made in God's likeness and image. They, they studied the, the nature of human memory, how it operates, coming down through people, primarily Aristotle. They also studied these particular memory uh, techniques. So these techniques are the kind of things I've written a few books about. Memorize the faith, memorize the mass, the Latin mass, um, memorize the reasons for, for Catholic answers. And, and I will say, these are special memory methods using your powers of visual imagination and special ordering systems. They are best for memorizing lists of things that you can put in your own words if you need to. Like the Ten Commandments, you can go boom, boom, boom. Oh, I'm in the, the fourth location in my house. There's a picture there. 
oh, my parents are up there because the fourth commandment is honor your father and your mother. You know, make them very, very, very concrete. And this was long called memory for things, memory for key concepts or ideas. And the kind of memory methods I write about, that's what they're easiest to be done. You can memorize the Ten Commandments. You can memorize the names of all the books in the Bible and know them in exact order, that kind of thing. But memorization of like long prayers or long particular parts of text, they call that um, memory for words as opposed to memory for things. And these techniques are not as effective because you can get overwhelmed with too much. So, so even the people like Albert and Thomas would recommend if you're going to memorize like a long prayer or a long scriptural text or other text, to kind of do it the old-fashioned way and, and do it by rote, re probably read it out loud or have someone else read it as you, as you listen to them, and do this time and time again. Now, I would say if a person's trying to do that and starting to get stuck, then these specialized memory techniques can also be pulled in. And if I could just get, you know, just give a simple example. If you're trying to memorize something like the Nicene Creed, I just looked at it earlier today and, and broke it down into kind of eight groups of four verses or or so. And for, for each one, like, you know, it starts, of course, I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, Creator, Maker of heaven and earth. You know, you might want to start at your first location in a memory house, just having like an eyeball. I, that's the first word that's going to trigger, I believe. And you might have an image of the heaven and earth there because it's going to trigger that. So hopefully you learn like the start of a verse. And if you've repeated enough, it kind of triggers what comes right next. But then you might, you might get stuck. Well, what comes next? You know, then it's, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So so now, uh, like we have an imaginary second location, not the front door, but the doormat. Then you'd be like, okay, here's another eyeball. That was a left eyeball. Here's the right. Now we have I again. But then you're going to see Jesus on the cross. So I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So anyway, you could kind of break it down after you've done traditional memorization to give yourself these little extra cues to kind of, kind of uh, boost you along the way in case you're getting stuck. Well, and then you've taken it and put it in like list form, right? <laughs> I mean, in some in a ways. Sense, in a sense, you have. Yeah. And, and you've just used the, the special techniques to the extent that you need them. You're not going to use them more than you need them. Kind of use a minimal trigger. And then if you've done this, even using these methods, once you've repeated it enough, you, you won't need to use the images anymore. You'll actually just have it through, through natural recitation. Well, it's interesting because you, you, you wrote um, Memorize the Faith. That was my first introduction to your work, you know, some 15 years ago or so. And I thought this is really, really helpful to me as a as a baby Catholic, right? Who's <laughs> trying to figure out yeah, everything? Just like lists of everything everywhere, you know, seven deadly sins, seven virtues, four marks of the church, four last things, you know, all this stuff, you know, all these works of mercy. And and so I, I found that extremely helpful. But Mike, uh, long before Albert and Thomas, uh, you've written a book about this about how music was really helpful in helping people to get. Um, these things down and, and memorize, especially concepts when people are trying to figure out how do you explain Christianity to somebody? And some of this stuff is really complex. Like how was music used in early Christianity to get this stuff worked into the brain? Well, it was used then as it's used now, as it was used in every generation. Uh, when um, and, and really, I mean, you, you learned things the same way. I'll bet that when you were very small, you memorized the books of the Bible as a Nazarene, you memorize the books of the Bible, and there was a song to, to There absolutely to make it was. Right, right. And I could sing it to you right now, but I'm not going to. <laughs> well, I know you could, you know, because... Galatians, because music... Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. I mean, I could do it right now. <laughs> right, right. It's of course in there. you could. Right. It's, it's locked. Right. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, 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 and at the end of your, at the end of your life, you'll still have that. Even if you have, have little else up there, you know, it's, it's going to be rolling around up there. I have a, a priest friend who says, uh, mass at a memory care unit. And he says that, that, um, that a lot of people don't know quite where they are, uh, but they, they, they can still sing the hymns. All right. That they, they can sing them robustly, especially if you sing the hymns from their childhood. Come Holy Ghost and Holy God, we praise thy name. They sing them robustly. Uh, and, and, and we're all that way. Uh, you know, Basil the Great, uh, noted that in his first homily on the Psalms. He says, he says, you know, you're all here listening to me right now. Uh, but I'll bet that, you know, before you leave here, you'll have forgotten what the gospel was about. You for, you'll have forgotten what my sermon was about. But you'll go home singing the responsorial psalm. 
right? Because that is going to stick in your mind because it has it has a melody to it. So yeah, these things these things have have uh, have have a melody. They it's a, just another way they they kind of stick in your mind. And I'll bet Kevin could could tell us a lot more about how that works too. Yeah, um, I bet I'm sure that's been part of your research is is rhythm and melody in this in this process too. But the fathers were very much aware of it. Yeah, that, that is so true. It, it just reminds me that like when Aristotle was laying out the, the nature of human memory, one element is there's an emotional element to it. We remember what, what impacts us emotionally, and, and song does that. It, you know, it can lift our spirits. Just, just one little example. I can still remember from being a child uh, going to church, our old Irish priest, when he would chant, you know, uh, through him, with him, and in him, and, and the chants they would use. I mean, that that always, you know, I can still remember that from all these years. And it just had, it just kind of hit you, you know, it hit you in the heart. So sometimes, yeah, the melody, the the rhythm, the richness that we get through song also strikes our emotional strings as well as our, you know, intellectual strings. And, and then we hang on to those things. Yes. You can go to a Pittsburgh Pirates game or a Chicago Cubs game, uh, or if you're a real you know, baseball fan, a Cincinnati Reds game. And multiple times throughout the course of a game, you'll hear just random things on the organ. Do, 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 do. And without even like realizing what you're doing, the whole room yells charge. Right, <laughs> right, right, right. right. Uh, there's, there's just something in that. Like, and nobody even knows where that's from or what it's about, right? I mean, it's sort of embedded to us. Uh, you know, none of us served in the American Revolutionary War, right? Uh <laughs> Maybe we got it from Bugs Bunny. Who knows? But it's in there. It's in there. Like, if I start the lyrics of, you know, I think I was talking about you, Mike, because we did a, 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 a segment on the radio recently about some stuff you'd written about poetry. Um, even if you don't have long poems like the ride of Paul Revere memorized, if I say Tommy used to work on the docks, you're going to be singing the whole rest of Bon Jovi with me. <laughs> it's in there. I mean, this is we remember all kinds of stuff. We remember stuff that's inexplicable, like Pop Goes the Weasel. I could do every word of right now, and I have no idea why. I mean, it's memorable. Or ridiculous advertising jingles from our childhood, you know? Oh, it's terrible. Rice Aroni, the San Francisco treat. Right? I mean, these these things are just stuck in there. They're 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 committed to memory. Yeah, yeah. Well, the we'll church figured it out our... before the advertisers did. <laughs> <laughs> Even now, sometimes if our, our two year old grandson Henry says "uh oh," kind of Kathy and I reflexively go "uh oh, spaghettios." Right, right. There's just so many of those. Yeah, there really are. Uh, so. There's a few different places I want to go with this because this is just such a, a massive topic, this question of memory and memorization. We've talked a little bit more about, you know, kind of the techniques and, and how it's functioning in, in church history and, and as a teacher. But there's this objection that comes, well, it comes from a few different places. So it certainly comes from um, people like myself who are Protestants and saw rite and ritual in the Catholic Church and were like, well, they don't mean any of this, right? It's just stuff they memorized. Right, so there's that critique. But I also remember this critique when I was in RCIA. Um, one of the times I was in RCIA, uh, there was a lady there, and I think she thought she was helping, but she was like, "I'm so glad you guys don't have to learn any of that stuff that I had to do." They made us memorize all this stuff. Like it was this this visceral resistance from people of a certain generation to the idea of memorizing things. And I remember thinking to myself, "Actually, that'd be really helpful to me right now." <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, you know, there was a lot of like, you know, sort of abstract things that were being taught um, at various points in certain RCIA classes I took. I I'm sorry that I'm using the plural here, but that's kind of how I was. Uh, but it, at any rate, uh, Catholics and Protestants alike tend to resist this idea to think that you're not really sincere in worshiping God if you're if what you're saying is memorized. I wonder if either of you could have something to say maybe in response to that. Absolutely. You know, uh, you know, your, your experience as a, as a parent teaches you otherwise, right? When you're small, you're still feeling all kinds of feelings, right? But you don't have words to express those feelings. And that's frustrating. Uh, you know, it, 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 you can't use your words. How many times have you said to right, kids, use your words? Right. And, and you can't, you can't use those words. You can't express those feelings until you have those words. So once again, as I said before, what you do is you, you try on grown up speech. Right. Stories give you a way of doing that. Rhymes give you a great way of doing that. Music gives you gives you words for that. And and, and, a, and a child gradually accumulates these ways of expressing 
problems and feelings and, 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 and curiosities and questions and that sort of thing. And, and you get, you get more out of life as you, as you gather, um, gather this vocabulary, gather these, these, um, varieties of expression. And I think that's true for us as Catholics too. Uh, our Lord said that we were to be, become like little children. And this is one way we have to recognize we are like little children. We've always got to be growing. We've, we've always got to be learning those words, making them our own. And again, doing what our Lord did, using the Psalms so that, so that these, these words come naturally to us. Think about it. Our Lord was done dying on the cross and he's quoting the psalms he's god from memory that's right that's right from, from memory. memory right so he's doing that on the cross and um and and he could have he could have said all kinds of brilliant original things but instead he quoted the psalms you know we want to have the ability to do that we've got to be growing in this way all of our years on earth yeah and i think you know that that, that is so spot on there's a Saying from a, a Russian uh, psychologist, he studied uh, memory and also language and speech development, uh, uh, Vygotsky. And one of his quotes, he said, for, for the child, to think is to remember. And for the adolescent, uh, to, adolescent, to remember is to think. So for that child, to think is to remember. The way they see the world, so much is built upon, I mean, they're sponges, you know, they're picking up every word that we, that we say. They're building that vocabulary. They're building their capacity to speak and remember. Because in a sense, the, the word infant means without speech. And when we don't have speech, we don't really have the capacity to, to remember early on in life. So yeah, our foundation as human beings is based on the things we remember, the words that we hear from others. And then by the time we're growing, we're adolescents, we have our reasoning abilities. He says, what then? For the adolescent uh, to remember is to think. Then at that point, you know, we can also use our rational abilities to enhance our abilities to remember. We can make connections. We can control our, our ability to focus and concentrate and determine how we remember things. So it's a beautiful uh, interplay there between memory and cognition. And I just think it's a shame because some people do tend to have the idea that, that memory and deep understanding are somehow opposed. Like you can't have one without the other. And though it's an argument from authority, sometimes I'll point out this to people. You know, some of the greatest champions of memory methods I know were Aristotle, the father of logic, Cicero, one of the most profound of all the ancient Romans, St. Albert the Great, the patron saint of scientists, and St. Thomas Aquinas, the patron saint of scholars. So some pretty deep thinkers there who encouraged us to, to use our capacities to remember. Yeah, and not just thinking, so so feeling too. Yeah. Feeling yeah. too, because it's our Lord on the cross, yeah. feeling something very deeply and just pulling he's something. He's definitely from expressing himself. Yes, right. Yes, um, he's not. He's not looking at a teleprompter in that moment. No, mm. I mean this is in him. Uh, it's about him, <laughs> right? I mean, yeah, the, right. The psalm, the psalm he's quoting is about him. But with all that too, so uh, there are a lot of, you know, sort of classical learning pedagogy things that have started to come back a little bit, um, and you know, one of the I'm going to do a terrible job of this because I don't, I don't do this for a living, but I, I talked to lots of friends who are trying to adopt this, right? You, you start at the early stages and, and you get in, into memoriz memorization and concepts, like, right? Um, this works especially well in math with times tables and, and, and all kinds of things. And then you know, a kid gets older, you start to assemble all those things that are in the brain and, and make the connections, as you were saying, uh, Dr. Vost. Um, but for people of, uh, you know, Catholic pedigree, if you do the memorization part, and then right around the time you hit eighth grade and you get confirmed, you graduate from Catholicism before you start to do the connection part, no wonder a whole bunch of people have left the church. That, that's exactly right. If I can pull another point, sometimes I borrow from the, the philosophical writings of the Stoics, and <clears throat> Epictetus has a saying there where he says, you know, uh, the, the goal of studying good philosophy, good ethics, you know, is not that you can just, uh, well, he said like, a sheep doesn't impress the shepherd that it ate its grass by vomiting the grass out uh, before the shepherd. No, instead, it, it consumes it and digests it and produces mole, wool and milk from that. So, yes, yeah, so we, so our goal should be not to be able just to parrot back these words, but to think about them, to, to ponder them, to digest them. So then we can, you know, live them out in our lives. We can write them in the tablets of our heart, as scripture tells us. So, so exactly right. What a shame. If we leave the church at the age where we, we've just learned the words and haven't really begun to digest the, the deeper meanings. Yeah. Mike, did you have anything to add to that before I get to my next question? No, I, I, I mean, just, just that, 
we we never graduate you know this idea that we're somehow finished when we're in eighth grade we've hardly begun and i mean i i was so immature at eighth grade i mean <laughs> my oldest daughter probably could have been running a major corporation at age <laughs> at age 14 but i was so immature you know yeah i had not yet begun to um to 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 really uh, assimilate what's there in the faith and and uh, apply it to my life yeah well and you know again this lifelong thing i mean on you know once or twice a month i'll go to mass and hear the same words that i've heard, heard for 17 years at this point and i'll be like wait has that always been in the mass yeah that's yeah. great <laughs> you know you'll hear a line and it just jumps out to you know but like, have i been saying this this whole time has the priest been saying this line this whole time yeah. you know and it and uh, you know the connections continue to be made uh, on and on i don't think it probably ever ends but but while we're talking about the mass, I mean, this is this is where we go from sort of like the granular idea of, of memory in the brain to kind of like the larger function of like the church having a memory, um, because that's what essentially like the mass is, right? Mm -hmm. The mass is the memory of the mystical body of Christ, just like what we've been talking about is the memory of us walking around our regular individual bodies. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll start with you, Dr. Vost. Uh, how does when the church talks about memory and memorial and remembering in the mass i mean how is that much bigger than what we would maybe be talking about in terms of memory on sort of the individual level yeah well, i think you know the words in the mass you know from g parenting uh echoing jesus you know do this in remembrance of me yeah one of the aspects of the mass is that memorial you know we're going to draw closer to god when we remember the reality of that sacrifice, what he has gone through for us, and, and the reason he has, has done that. So yeah, I mean, memory is a far, far deeper sense than, you know, it's not saying remember these exact words. You're going to be better off if you, if you do remember them. But the main thing is to remember the, the fundamental reason that we're there, all pointing to the reality of Christ on the cross and Christ in the Eucharist. He's, he died so he is able to give us himself to us. So, you know, so he can cleave to our inmost, uh, parts. In the, in the communion. So yes, I mean, so fundamental aspect uh, of the Mass itself is, is, again, not just the individual memory, but here we are, we're all together sharing in this memory of the most important, you know, uh, event in, in, in all of the universe there. So it's this deep in significance. It's not just a matter of words. It's not just a matter of intellect. It should be a matter of, of inflaming our hearts and our love uh, for Jesus every time we're at Mass. Well, and just... Uh... You know, Mike, you've written about this because you write a lot about the early church. The early church doesn't like start from scratch with all these ideas and concepts, right? They're they're living off the memory of a people, um, and the Jewish concept of memory is intrinsic to kind of how we think about this stuff as Catholics and carry it forward, isn't it? Yeah, there are scholars who say that the Hebrew word zikaron has never been translated ac accurately. Or adequately, because um, because it's a Hebrew concept. It's kind of peculiar to biblical religion. It's it's uh, it's ritual memory, uh, and it's uh, it's more than a psychological act. When we when we say remember, when we talk about memory, we're talking about a purely psychological act. But ritual memory is different. It's a it's a remembering. It's a recalling, a recollecting, bringing all these things back together again in the present. So in a sense, we're sharing God's experience of memory. And for God, all things are present. So we're sharing that moment. So when um when 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 the Jews celebrated the Passover, when our Lord himself celebrated the Passover with his disciples, they had the understanding that this was not just a past event. It's a past event that we're sharing in the present. It was really present, right? So they themselves were undergoing the exodus. And the words of the Passover Seder reinforce that. It's all in the present tense. The Mishnah said that that every man must must celebrate the Passover as if he himself was undergoing the exodus. So this is a really present event. Now, our, it was at a Passover meal that our Lord instituted the Eucharist. And when he said, do this in memory of me, do this as my memorial, he was drawing upon that, that distinctively Hebrew, that peculiarly biblical understanding of zikaron, memory. And we still celebrate this today because we talk about his real presence in the Eucharist, that we 
are there at Calvary. We are there in the upper room. We are there at the empty tomb. We undergo the entire Paschal mystery as if it is in present tense. Well, that's what's so interesting about the whole thing and how different it is when you go to various Protestant communions like the ones that you know that I grew up in. When we talk about a memorial, we're talking about something. I mean, not to be crass, it's almost like the, I don't know, like the Bob Hope Memorial Golf Tournament, right? It's like, man, wasn't Bob a great guy? Uh, every <laughs> time we gather, we should tell stories about him and like thank him for setting up this foundation that we can give to in his honor, right? Yeah. I mean, that's – and I think it also leads to confusion about another point that is often an objection uh, from, from non-Catholic Christians, and that is they think that we're uh, re-crucifying Jesus, <laughs> At mass, we're re-sacrificing him. But if you understand what the church means by memory, and that idea of ritual memory, we're going back to that spot over and over again where it happened. Um, and even to say that it happened is using kind of time language for something that's really an eternal thing. Yeah. So how can you remember something that's in eternity? I mean, this is, these are big, big questions. Uh, I mean, in a sense, it's more like we're being remembered <laughs> than it is that we're doing the remembering. Yeah. Um, and Dr. Vos, I mean, you, you, you're you helping people to memorize these pieces of the Mass, so I imagine that this is part of what you're trying to bring out. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to bring, yeah, bring out this reality here, the, uh, what's going on in the Mass, and the, how every particular rite has a deep meaning, how so many of the words come from Scripture themselves. And another aspect I, I love about the beauty and wisdom of our Catholic Mass is that even in terms of psychology, when we talk about memory, there's all different kinds of memory. And one kind is called procedural memory. And it can be memory for things we do with our physical bodies. Remember how to ride a bicycle. So, of course, in the Mass, we're not just using our mouths. We're doing bodily gestures. We're making signs. We're, we're kneeling. We're standing up. Another thing that can confuse some people new to the Mass, how do they all know when to do all this? But it's just another simple way that we're honoring God through through all that we are, using our bodies, uh, you know, our bodies in their entirety. So just so many beauties there in the Mass. And when I've written about just the, memorizing the particular rites of the Mass, I'm writing about not necessarily how to memorize this every word of every prayer. That's a pretty daunting task. But if you have a general idea of the, the order of the couple dozen or three dozen or so rites as you go through the Mass, you kind of always know where you are, you're, you're anticipating, and then maybe you can take the time later to dig, to read more, to dig deeply into the exact meaning behind each one of those uh, rites. And if I remember right, when I was preparing my first book on Memorizing the Mass, it was one of Mike's books, was one of my guides in digging deeper into the to the meaning of each one of those rites, which are all of which, of course, are, are amazingly rich in, in, in beauty. That's pretty cool. You know, and and, and the other aspect of, of the ritual memory is because of that, um, it creates a, a unity around the world and across time that isn't present if you are not working off of ritual memory. So you and I, all three of us could go to three different countries where none of us knows the language and has ever even heard a word of it in our lives. But if it's the mass, we'll still know when to sit, stand, and kneel, and we'll know what's happening when, right? right. And I've actually had that happen to me because I don't know French. But uh, this is this is the kind of thing that the church, you know, has has put together and and carried forth in, in such a unique way, so that I may not know the words, but I remember I remember what we're doing, and I remember what we're doing when. Uh, and it's, it's, it, I'm still able to pray. I, I still know what's happening. It's an incredible thing. Whereas, you know, back in my, uh, evangelical days, if I were to go across the world and go visit a country I'd never been to with a language I didn't know, I'd have no idea what was going on. I wouldn't know That's what right. the lesson was. I wouldn't know any of the songs. I wouldn't know any of it. I wouldn't know how this is going to end, <laughs> right? I just, you just wouldn't know it. But, um, uh, any, any other thoughts on this? Because I can't believe that we've already filled up as much time as we have, but any other kind of closing parting sh shots that you wanted to share on this question of, of memory, memorization, how it all works in the life of the church? I'd say that that the best place for this to happen is is at home in the family. You know, it's it's in the songs you sing together. It's in the 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 rhymes that you choose to say out loud to your children and your 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 grandchildren. And I think this should be part of life. It's how we pass on a culture. Uh, I think. These days, we're becoming too dependent on video and that sort of thing, and these these wonderful things that are all accessible to us all the time. But we're losing that personal connection. We're losing that sense that that um that our children will will get these things uh, in our voices, 
And it's those voices that will create a bond and, and, and will remain in their, their, their heads forever. You know, I've got a, my, my grandmother who, if she's watching this, you know, she'll, she'll laugh because she, she knows she said this over and over, you know, that, uh, so many of us have grown up and, and, uh, don't necessarily have the, the same Tennessee accent, you know, we were raised with. And, and part of that's because of broadcasting. And, and whenever I go back to my family for days, uh, Andy Mitchell makes fun of me on the radio for my, cause it all comes right back. Right. <laughs> but in some sense it's, it's teaching, um, our families how, like the Catholic accent, right. It's, mm. it's the, uh, it's the way of, of speaking and talking. Like when it comes out of you, everybody can be like, I, I know where that guy's from, <laughs> you know? Uh, so I think that's, I think that's in there too. Dr. Vost, uh, any closing thoughts for you on this topic since you're, well, you're the memory man? Well, I just got to echo, echo Mike on this one that, yeah, it starts with the domestic church at home. Here's where we can really begin to lay those lessons that are then fortified when we join together with other families at mass. So, so important to show our children that this material is the most important material in the world. It's so, it's so worth knowing because it connects us in a personal relationship to Jesus Christ and the communion and saints. So, so start young, show them it's, it's worth memorizing because it's so, it's just so important. And then also, yeah, that aspect of the, the, the value of the face to face, you know, these days I do a lot of uh, work through the internet and radio and so on, which is, thank God, I think is absolutely wonderful. But we make, we need to make sure we never lose the value of that face to face interaction that can make such a difference, especially in those early years of our life. So yeah, I'd say start them young, start them within the family and start them with the, the beauty and fullness uh, of the Catholic teachings. Well, it's interesting that even in those, that, uh, that Jewish world, right? Um, everybody might know the words to the Passover, but you still got to go to Jerusalem, right? <laughs> you still got to go. Right. Um, well, I know that uh, we've covered a bunch of different topics that you all have both written about in some of the books and, and, and other projects that you've done. We'll start with you, Dr. Vost, because you've written stuff that, I mean, if you Google Dr. Kevin Vost and memorize, you're going to find him straight off. But I wonder if you could steer people towards the books you've written that are most specifically about um, this topic. Sure, sure. The, the first one I did was uh, Memorize the Faith for Sophia Press. It came out in 2006. And you mentioned that was how you became, uh, how you first knew me and that it was helpful when you came back to the church. And I will just have to say, I was newly back to the church after 25 years of atheism when I wrote that book. So the wise people at Sophia Institute Press greatly helped me by suggesting the particular materials I should help people remember. Uh, the next book was Memorize the Reasons for Catholic Answers. And there our focus was on apologetics, like memorizing things like, you know, why do we believe the Pope is infallible? Why do we believe these four Marian dogmas you know why do we believe there's there's more to the church than scripture alone so so apologetic then i did a book memorize the mass for on route books and media and memorize the 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 latin mass to just got to go through the the rites of the mass and allow us to dig a little bit deeper into their meaning and the most recent one i i did this year was a book called uh memorize the stoics that applies these same methods to some of the the night the the pagan ethical lessons the good ones you know that come from natural reason through the ancient the Stoic philosophers. But then I also show what Christian uh, church fathers and thinkers like Albert and, and Thomas have made of their insights along the way. So those are my main primary memory books. Memorize the faith, memorize the reasons, memorize the mass, memorize the Latin mass, and memorize the Stoics if, if I memorized all those right. Well, and you've got a lot of really cool tricks for memorizing things. Uh, I can't go into all of them now, but they involve like Yoda and bodybuilders and <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all kinds of ways to sort of like they evolved tattoo from Fantasy Island. Like you're you're using all kinds of images to help people remember these things, and they really are, uh, really are cool ways to 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 memorize these concepts. Mike, you do a lot with patristics and the early church, so you talk a lot about the the way that the early church was teaching these things to a yeah. culture that was oral and not literate. So, what are some of the books that you've written that people might be interested in in regard to that? Two that come to mind right away are The Mass of the Early Christians, which is one of my books from way back, but I think it's still relevant to this, um, because, uh, because what we're talking about there is the liturgy, the, the ritual public worship of the church, you know, hearing these things and, 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 uh, and, and learning them by heart. Again, think about that as the, um, the, the the common synonym for memorization that we use learn it by heart so it's not just rote it's not just mechanical you're learning it by heart um so the mass of the early christians how the fathers read the bible another one because the fathers uh you know in their congregations their congregations could not afford to own a bible 
they had to hear it and they had to commit some of it uh, to memory in this way. So those two books and also my book Rhymes Reasons, uh, which is about poetry and how we use that to pass on our our, um, our moral values and our uh, our, uh, our our the things uh, the things that we we prize in every way. Can I force you to mention one more? Yeah. Uh, your your book on how the choir built the church. Oh sure, 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 sure. Uh, yeah. So so how how the choir uh, converted the world is is the the title. Uh, the subtitle is through hymns, with hymns, and in hymns, which is because... a great subtitle, by the way. <laughs> mm, <love> that. <laughs> because that's how music evangelized back then. You know, it's uh it 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 uh it 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 gave you an earworm, right? Uh, you know, uh, Jesus Christ was for most people not a creed. You know, not a philosophical argument, but a song they couldn't get out of their head. Yeah. Well, even when you go and think about the fact that uh, so many older hymns, when you look at them, the last verse is always like something like, glory be to God right. the Father, glory be to God the Son, glory to the Holy Spirit, glory to the three in one, or some variation on that theme, because at the end of the day, they, they want to have a doxology in, but they also want to teach you who it is that God is that we're worshiping. I mean, it's, it's all built into that stuff. That was introduced into hymnography uh, by by Hillary and Ambrose uh, as as an as an antidote to Arianism. So people would have Trinitarian theology, you know, committed to memory in that way, in a way that rhymed. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 wild. So, man, what a great conversation! I hope it really is helpful to some people who feel uh, again. Like it's a daunting task to memorize some of these things or, or maybe you don't understand why it's memorized. Why can't you can't just like feel and express what's on in your heart? Well, you should. Right. But these things are more mechanisms to help us, you know, put put words to to well, well, to use our words like we were just talking about earlier, like when we're kids who uh, don't have a language for the kinds of things we want to say to God. Somehow it's always in the Psalms. Sometimes it's you just you find a psalm and you're like, that's exactly what I've been thinking, but I haven't figured out how to say it yet. So hopefully helpful to you. Um, please do reach out to us if you're at any stage of the journey. Maybe you're a Catholic coming back and some of these songs you learned as a kid or some of these concepts or things you memorized as a kid are, are coming back to you and and, uh, and 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 drawing you back to the Mass. Or maybe you're coming from the outside and wondering how in the world you're going to ever remember any of this stuff. Uh, hopefully this has been a little bit helpful to you. Um, Again, go to chnetwork.org. Lots and lots of free resources. We are a community of people walking alongside one another. So that's the bulk of what we do uh, is, is help people on the journey. So please don't hesitate to reach out to us. And uh, if you're someone who appreciates this, who's already in the church and doing pretty great, please do support our work so we can continue to make these resources available to others. chnetwork.org slash donate. Mike Aquilina, Kevin Vost, always a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. That's welcome. Thanks for having us. And again, I'm Matt Swaim, Director of Outreach for the Coming Home Network. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode of CH Network Presents.